video on a Cotman Sketcher set that I was sort of going to convert for en plein air use this summer. And I've just done my first en plein air of the year, finally. It was my last day of holiday off work. I'm now back at work for three days, then I'm off again for another week and a half. So um, I thought we've got this fantastic heat wave at the moment in the UK. It was nearly 30 degrees here today. I couldn't not go and paint. It was so much a good an opportunity. So what I thought I'd do is show you all the things I have in my, in my bag for en plein air and um, everything I use, what I do with it. And that includes the Cotman Sketcher set that I've now modified somewhat. Now, I just need to apologise that the tripod is a bit wobbly, propping it up with my leg. So sorry if it falls. So first and most important things that were in there are SPF 30 um, lip glossy stuff and SPF 50 um, travel size um, sun cream sunblock stuff. These are really important because it's really easy to forget how long you've been out in the sun when you're painting on plein air. So I always set an alarm on my phone for however long these things last, um, like an hour or whatever, and then I reapply. I did spray myself with an SPF 50 spray before I went out. And as soon I went and got coffee, and then as soon as I went and sat in the park to paint, I applied the cream over my legs and my arms and I've still got a little bit of burn so it is so so important and it's such a high risk of skin cancer please please don't forget your sun cream so in terms of what I take with me I have two sketchbooks um, that I like to use and one of them is kind of a backup sketchbook at the moment so I'm going to show you if I can reach it the one I prefer to use, but it's full. So because it's full, I'm using another one as a kind of um, backup. So these are the ones. Um, these are the ones that I'm using. Kind of would normally be using. They've got this fantastic banana fiber uh, covers made by a company called Pink Pig, I think. Let me just check the label. Yeah, Pink Pig. So this is a 25 page Sienna cover landscape A5 book and it's got Amelie watercolour paper 270 gram per square metre which is just a bit lower, about maybe £140, £120 pounds maybe and I just kind of you know do my little sketches and things I've seen on tutorials online and all that sort of thing in here. I mean, it really is just where I kind of do experimental stuff, play with different background techniques, uh, playing with different shades of green to see how they give a sense of distance, different colours for sunsets. And I do a lot of mixing in here. I've got a lot of things swatched out, like all of the browns and the oranges that I have, because I was trying to find a good mix. I did a lot of colour mixing in here. And I've got a lot, of these kind of spectrum sheets that I refer to and I've also done started doing the same with Tim Holt's Distress Inks so I'm now working back through that book the other way so that's my watercolour one and I have a general sketchbook in the same line which is also from Pink Pig that I got discounted to £4.43 and this is 35 pages it's a yellow silk cover and it's uh, cream cartridge paper, 150 grams per square meter, so about 75 pounds maybe. And this is cartridge paper, as we call it in the UK. I think that's just called drawing paper in the US, but I'm not too sure. And what I really do with this is just sort of sketching. That's alcohol markers. Um, I don't know why I wrote one day I'll fly away on that. I think I was just testing out this stamp and I wanted to do a bit of journaling just to kind of see how the page looked and that's done using Tim Holtz distress sprays which I've got a review coming up on and I've done one with gesso which is um interesting a spirally one testing out some stencils in here as well and then this is really for just sketching so I always have the two of those whenever I kind of do anything in the field because they're a good size they're a5 which is pretty small um let's get a size for my American audience of what A5 actually is. It's about five and three quarter wide and about eight inches long. So 
I'm sure there's something in the US that's similar in size, but for those in the US that don't know, we use A sizes in most of Europe rather than letter and ledger that you use. So that's why we have these slightly odd sizes. So my backup watercolour sketchbook at the moment is a Moleskine one. I really like Moleskine normally. I've forgotten which paper this actually is. This is their watercolour um, notebook. Maybe it tells me no in their little thing. So it's got an envelope thing in the back where you can stuff things. And this is really well made. I mean, this has got like fabric um, supports. It's got a good cover. Let me see if I can move back a little bit and kind of show it to you. So it's a bit smaller. Let me just stabilise this. Sorry, I've got a wonky tripod issue. I'm having to sit on it. It's not good. So, yeah, it's got quite a lot of pages. I've forgotten which watercolour paper this is, but it used to say on the label when you buy it which watercolour paper is in it, and I know they've changed it in the last year because I think it used to be Bockingford at one point. It's a cold press paper. It's reasonably thick, so you don't really need to worry about it buckling. I tend to either put a bit of tape over the edge, or today I didn't do anything, I just used it as is. And it's got the usual Moleskine crap at the front. And these are really expensive, but I do like Moleskine products, I just find them pretty. So it's got, again, a load of sketches, and I was trying out Wax Resist there just to see how it worked. Trying out petals using um, a squirrel mop to sort of stamp them. Trying out more Wax Resist techniques, and then... The sketches I did today, so just ignore kind of that side because I that was an afterthought to add that landmass. But I just wanted a study really to give me the proportions of where the breakwater. Um, so the breakwater is about a mile long and it's about a mile from the coast, and it's got a salvation sanctuary cage at this end where if it's a storm, a sailor could climb into it and not get swept away. A beacon at this end and a fort from I think the 1800s or the 1700s just beyond it in the water in the middle and I wanted to see where it is in relation to this landmass and this island and I drew this little sketch of a boat here in shadow colour. The reason I did that was because one of them was going past up and down after I'd nearly finished but I wanted to put one in as a sense of scale just so that if I want to add a boat when I turn this into an actual painting then I I know how to do that. Now the reason the water is different colours is because this is where there is a rip and where there is a rip you have um, sort of stiller water so I wanted to kind of show where that was. This is hard standing, the Victorians were obsessed with uh, bathing where you walk into the water here so they had all these kind of concrete and stone hard standings built and they're now covered in kelp so this was at low tide, the tide was going out, this is normally covered and this is a little harbour, and I actually live right next to that harbour. So this is about a five minute walk away, up a long flight of steps, and I'm sitting in a park, looking down into the sea. So there's nothing between me and the water, totally unimpeded, really beautiful view. So I was just trying to get them a study on paper. I also did that island in more detail. It's terrible because it's the wrong greens, it's way too bright. I just wanted to try and get the shape down. It's a really difficult thing to to draw because the sun is always behind it. So this area here is a total mystery because it's always almost totally black when you're trying to paint it at any time of the day. It's got a lot of crenellations and cannons and, and old barracks here because it's a sort of um, it's an island that um, was used a lot in the 1700s for defence. So it, it had a lot of structures on it and it's had a really weird, interesting history and. I just wanted to get these two land masses in. Um, this is darker than it should be, but I was trying to get a good dull olive to reflect the trees, whereas this is farmland, so this is like a different green. But it should have been that the back one was lighter than the front one because the sense of distance is totally off there. But I just wanted to sketch it just to get that overall shape, and then I will use photographs to fill in the gap here and put some proper stuff. And the other one I did was a study of um, on the actual mainland, and again, it's a study, it's not meant to look like anything. But there is a thing called the Belvedere, and these columns are taken from an old monastery, and it's got a really long history. It's basically a viewing platform um, on three levels, but these are just the top two. So you've got the top level, some stairs down, uh, and some stairs down to the third level that I haven't drawn, which is the old bull ring where people used to buy and sell bulls. 
This lighthouse is actually over here, but I moved it for artistic reasons. That lighthouse used to be, in the olden days, there, but many miles away, the Edistone light, and they replaced it, I think, in the 1800s. And the people of the city loved the old one so much, because it had protected so many ships that they paid to have it brought ashore and they built, they rebuilt it brick by brick uh, on the land and it's got a cafe in it now which is about to become a bar and you can go up to the top and there's now a little viewing platform and it's quite a pretty building and it got fairly recently painted in, in those colours so I moved that, I moved these trees, this is the citadel um, which is again another wonderful piece of history I've slightly moved that because the the laboratory, which is of the Marine Biological Association of the UK, is actually there, but it's not quite so impressive, so I've moved the buildings a bit. And I just wanted to kind of get the shapes in, and I've made notes on things like, for example, these gaps here. I've got a note over here that tells me how many pillars are in each of those sections. I've got a note that shows me this particular pattern in the plaster work is repeated underneath each of these gaps which have got these little mini pillars in them so I didn't have to draw the detail but I have recorded it so that I can use it when I do a later painting. The other thing I moved were these bushes which are actually just off to the side I thought they'd be really nice right in the foreground kind of start the picture there and put some trees on this side to give it some sort of framing I guess and in amongst those, they're really, um, the reason these kind of look like they're floating, I suppose, is that the real ones actually have a wall running all the way through here, and these overhang a wall. So there's some dark yellow flower that's in bloom at the moment, and red valerian, which is here. And I, I really love red valerian. It's so characteristic of this part of the UK at this time of year. It covers every wall. So I painted that in just with Opera Rose, just to kind of spot it in. Um, I spent a while getting the colour of the lighthouse correct, um, which was this. It was a mixture of light red and burnt sienna to get that colour. And I always put out the colours that I used. Um, this is the top of the lighthouse because I couldn't fit it on the page. So I just drew it separately with its colours and its shading so that I know at that time of day what the whole scene would look like. And I'm going to use that to make a much larger painting, um, possibly even the same painting in different seasons, who knows. But I just wanted a study that I, that I could work from. And the other picture, so that picture was done in light red, burnt sienna, hooker's, light, hooker's green light, Cad Yellow Pale and Cad Yellow, and Opera Rose as that kind of surprise element for the flowers. That previous one was Cobalt Blue, Gamboge, Burnt Sienna and Raw Sienna, so pretty simple. And then that third one was Sap Green, because I was cheating, I just couldn't be bothered to mix a green, I wanted to go home at that point. Raw Sienna, because I needed it for the beaches, because I don't have um, Titanium Buff or Naples Yellow in this set at the moment. Ultramarine for the sea because it was so blue at that time of day. Hooker's Green Dark because I needed a darker green for this area here. And I used Cad Red Deep so that I had something I could mix with Ultramarine and get a really dark shade to do the shading under the jetty and in this area that's really dark because it's kind of got a sort of overhang. So that's the colours I used and why in my little Moleskine book. So I always kind of treat it as a two-page setup. I paint on this side, I make my notes on this side, what time, what colours, anything else. So that's kind of how I paint. In terms of uh, what I paint with, my Cotman set kind of conversion that I was doing, so the palette now lives separately, I've taken that off and I just stick it on when I'm using it. It was so, so hot today that the paint just dried almost instantly on the palette, I didn't need to worry about that. But ordinarily I would have just wiped it off. So this is the set. It's the sketcher set that I've done in my previous video that I'll link. And that's my little sheet that's got all the colours on it. It's got, just dropped the brush, it's got the extra ones I added and the ox score indicated. And it's just, I don't know if you can see this, but it's been in my bag 
and all the colors have jumped around so let me just pop those back in they go in really really easily actually um, once you can work out where it went wrong so in this case they slipped and I did debate whether it was necessary to put something in these gaps at the end to stop that happening and I thought no that's never gonna happen there's no point doing that but it did so lesson learned I'm gonna have to put some padding into this to uh, stop that happening I'm just trying to see these blues because some of them are a bit mixed up so excuse me if I sound a tad distracted while I put them back because I do want them to be correct so the modifications I really made to this set other than putting the colors in the order I want them in and adding to the set a couple of colors I added green gold and I added opera rose because I like them and I won't will be sorry I will be adding some more colors really very shortly because uh, I don't like any of these pointless blacks they're, they're totally unnecessary and I don't want them so they have to go and if they're going they've got to be replaced with something that's actually going to be useful and that something is quite likely to be uh, things like Naples yellow, uh, some useful colours. So this is that set, now it's all been put back together. This is a sponge that I will show you in a minute. And that is really useful because you can uh, wipe your brush on it uh, if it's damp to clean your brush off. So after you've dipped it in the water you can dry it on that. Or if you're doing as I was, I was just using a water brush, I was just cleaning it on this. And it was so good and I could also clean the palette with it in between each painting which was really fantastic. So let me just pick up that brush that I've mercilessly thrown to the floor. It was... I got it. It was the one from the Cotman Sketches set, um, the little sort of fake sable I suppose it is. I didn't actually use it, I put it in there just in case I needed a finer brush. Didn't end up actually um, going near it so I'll take that back out and put that into the sketches set where it belongs because I like to keep things just so. This is a size triple zero renaissance squirrel um, mop. You can see it's gone really frizzy because of the temperature and the humidity but it behaved really well. I only used it to paint the skies um, and the sea where I needed like to cover a large space really quickly so that was kind of what I used. Didn't use any ox gall today, though it's it's in the kit. Um, I didn't use any... Um, I used Opera Rose. I didn't use my other kind of added colour. That sponge, uh, incidentally, was cut from these um, facial sponges that are pretty soft. And it's really easy to cut blocks of that because it's quite thick. So I really recommend that. And the offcuts you can just put with your sponges, you know, for, for painting techniques. And I kept actually the offcut, which was like half of one of these, as you'll see. And I used that for cleaning the palette and, and everything else. So my kind of wet supplies that I took, so there's that grubby sponge that I was using. I had a couple of water brushes, a medium and a fine, a mister, and a couple of little bottles, which are like travel bottles of water. Um, one of them, this one, is like the dirty water for washing the brush. The other one was the clean water that I used to refill the water brushes. I only had to refill one of them three times, and that was in blazing heat. So I was having to re-wet the paint all the time. You'll see this is a Winsor & Newton um, little pouch. This came with four different media in it as like a kind of £10 trial kit of different media. And, I, and I've got a video on those coming up. So I decided to, there's no point keeping them in a pouch when they're in your studio. So I decided to repurpose this and use it for travel and for um, painting. And the other thing I repurposed was this Daler and Rowney case that had a set of gold Teclon, really cheap acrylic brushes in it. It's like a whole set for like £10. And I thought I'd put some drawing supplies in there because I was maybe intending to do some sketching. I had just an HB pencil, which I did use, a paper stump, a uh, sanguine Conte um, pastel. And then um, some more specialist pencils, and I'll just explain what they are. They're all by Derwent. There's a sepia pastel pencil, and there are three tinted charcoals, which are in sunset pink, sand, 
sorry, there's Sunset Pink and Sound, and then this one's just a plain charcoal, a dark charcoal, just because I thought they'd be useful, and a cheap Derwent uh, vinyl eraser, or rubber as we call them in the UK. Stop giggling, American audience. So that was what I took with me. Yes, look at the state of my studio table. It's an absolute bomb site at the moment. I took those with me. I had really good time. It went really well. I'm really happy with it. So my next sort of step is going to be first of all I'm going to use this as is this little cotton and sketches set I'm going to unwrap the paints shortly and next week when I get paid I'm going to turn some of them into the real thing so like the cadmiums I will change into real cadmiums because you just can't paint with fake cadmiums I'm sorry you need the real thing and the little brush will go in there and I'm going to just keep that in my work bag with some postcards some watercolour postcards and I'm just going to be able to then paint things if I see them. Uh, just as people would take a photo and put it on Instagram. I'm going to paint things when I see them a little bit more. So I thought that would be really good fun as the summer kind of progresses. Um, so that's kind of my plans. That's my sort of everyday sketching in my bag. And the other one is in my sort of the bag I use when I either go painting or I go to the woods to look for something like slime moulds or, or go to Dartmoor and climb up hills. But um, at the moment, it's a painting bag. I had a really good time. I've got a little bit of sunburn. I'm going to bed early because I think I'm a bit dehydrated. So I'm going to drink a gallon of water and go to bed. So good time had by all. And that's how I've adapted a studio palette for working on plein air. If anyone has got any further ideas on how to adapt it, things they might like to add, adaptations they've made themselves, or questions about on plein air painting, please pop a comment and give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video so that you'll see more of them when I post them. Thanks very much.